Okay, uh, welcome to uh, session two of Quick Pass. Uh, today we're going to, you know, go over um, conditional statements and also introduce functions. Um, yesterday we went over the basic data types, and hopefully you had a chance to go over the exercises and kind of play with uh, some of the data types and also a lot of the string methods that we learned. Uh, and so, um, yeah, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, before we get started, though, um, I think we have a couple questions. Uh, so go ahead. Oh, I thought you had a question. I'm sorry. I see it in the chat. Um, oh, OK. Um, no. So uh, are you talking about what, what assessment are you talking about? The live coding assessment? Yes, I was going to ask that question, but then you just said that he'll be there tomorrow so I can just write everything that I really wanted to know down and I can wait. Okay. It's okay. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, let me get that attendance link for you and then we can also do that as well. So we can do that. Uh, you, you can go to this link whenever during the class. All right, there it is. And we'll send it uh, a couple more times just so everyone, you know, if you miss it this time, you'll get it again. Because this chat typically fills up and it's kind of hard to find things by the end of the class. So, um, did everyone, uh, so sometimes I'll throw an exercise in the chat too, like I did um, yesterday. Uh, I was just like, hey, I'm going to go and have them, you know, try to do the, you know, one of the string methods. And um, so I threw that in there. Did everybody try that or did y'all even see it? Okay. So yeah, I put one in there. Some folks answered it. And so uh, again, that's, you know, for your benefit, you can do it, try it out. Um, typically I'll just throw one out there that will, you know, it's covered in the previous, the previous lesson. If you want to do it, you don't have to again, um, but it's, it's for your benefit. But let me go ahead and start sharing my screen and we can dive into lesson two. Um, I'm thinking tonight I'll probably finish the, the lesson uh, fairly early. And if that's the case, we can then go over exercises and do some coding together. I'm here till nine. So um, we'll still get some, we'll get plenty of time to, to do stuff. So uh, start sharing. I am going to move some things around. Give me one second. Okay. All right. So uh, today we're going to go over conditional statements and go over some truthy, falsy logic and functions. And um, so we're going to kind of revisit Booleans and then how they're used. We're going to do some, uh, we're going to go over some comparison operators, some other other ways to go through logic. Uh, you know, and if, if you think about, you know, the, the pre-course information, the programmatic thinking uh, items I put in here, really you want to think about, um, let me see if I can find them here. Yeah, so when, when you're looking at a problem, uh, and you're trying to break it down into, into those, those very basic steps, those very basic questions. You always want to bring yourself down to a yes or no question when you're breaking a problem down or you're building something. Uh, that's, that's, that's the hard part, getting away, you know, thinking through your problem and, and breaking it down that way. And we're going to start with some uh, pretty easy stuff here. Uh, but as we go through Quick Pass, I'm going to introduce some things. Uh, and you'll see things introduced where, you know, it's bigger and bigger problems that, you know, you don't necessarily immediately see how you can you can put all those steps in there until you break it down. And so really, that's one of the skills of becoming a you know developer and, and that programmatic thinking is, you know, breaking the problem down into sub problems that you may have to break even further down until you get to that point where you're saying yes, no, uh, and allowing your script to make decisions. And then. Of course, taking all that logic and putting it into functions. So functions are a big part of, of programming in general. 
uh, functions are, you know, they're the bread and butter. So you'll be putting, you'll be putting stuff into functions all the time. Uh, you know, giant scripts, you know, I, I've seen those before where you have, you know, giant scripts and, it, and it's, you know, 10,000 lines of code and it's, it's nothing but logic trees with hardly any functions. Um, while it can run, it can be very confusing and hard to, to read and hard to follow. Uh, so using functions is a lot better. And uh, you'll see as you, you see more complicated scripts, uh, you'll see not only are functions separated, then you're separating things into files uh, and different modules uh, that have functions in them. And, uh, and you'll see how it gets organized. And so, you know, we're going to go over these two things and then uh, we're going to uh, go through our conclusion and, and you can take a look at the assignments. We can also revisit anything from the previous lessons or even the pre-course. Uh, if you have any questions on those, you can ask those then. So let's go ahead and dive in. So um, at a lot of the top of a lot of lessons, I'm going to have these uh, links. So in this case, I have uh, some links uh, to go over um, Python types. You know, in this case, the Boolean type, you know, some truth value testing. Uh, these links are for your benefit. Uh, take Feel free to look at those um, because they're, they're for your benefit. Uh, so uh, just like I mentioned yesterday with the Boolean type, it can only be one of two values, and that's true or false. Uh, and they um, can be explicitly defined. And sometimes we, we do define a, you know, a variable as true or as false. Uh, but more often than not, we define a variable based on the result of an expression. So we come to a true or a false uh, and then define a variable with that and then use that variable to for further you know, decisions down the road uh, in our script. Um, so uh, taking a look here, uh, you know, the variable X, and if you remember in like, you know, again, in uh, algebra class, X would not be a good variable name. Uh, you typically want to have a very descriptive name. And I have some examples down here. I'll show you better, uh, better variable names. But if you have a variable x and you assign it to value 35, then if you wrote the expression x is greater than 40, then you know that would value the false because x is not greater than 40. And that's what that expression is there. So that x greater than 40, that's like, it's like making a statement and then you have to evaluate that statement. So x greater than 40, well, no, it's not, it's false. So, um, so comparing and contrasting those values against others, is very important uh, and it's an important skill to develop. Um, it comes to some people easier than others, but it's it's a way you have to think as a developer. Um, and if you take a look at it, if you remember, I talked about some, uh, some of the special formatting that we have with Jupyter Notebooks. You see how they're, they're kind of bold and purple uh, on my screen. They may show up different ways on your IDE, but these uh, are reserved words in Python, uh, and the pre-course has a, a bit of code to run to kind of see all the reserved words and the special the special terms that we have in Python that you you can't assign to variables, um, or you can't assign as a variable name, uh, which you, you wouldn't anyway. But in this case, we have our Boolean type, and we know it's a Boolean type because we're wrapping it in the type method and we're running it and we have Boolean there. So we can see Boolean, but we also know it's kind of a reserved word because it has the purple coloring. Uh, and just remember, it's always a capital T and capital F for false. Like you can't have lowercase, that wouldn't be recognized by Python. Um, and so again, like I mentioned, you can uh, you can assign you can directly assign a boolean uh, to a variable, and then you can use that variable later. In this case, I'm using it right after in the print method, and the print method is just printing out the result of what I just defined, and then I'm getting the type of it. So I'm kind of run the same the same uh, same method there, and so uh, I just I just mentioned again that true and false have to be capitalized. They don't mean anything uh, if you do not have that. So if I tried to run this, 
I would get an error because the name false with lowercase f is not defined. So um, just keep in mind that when you see these errors, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, sometimes it's, it, you know, they're pretty descriptive and they can tell you kind of what's going on. Uh, and you see like how it even tells you what line of code. So say I had a hundred lines of code and I see an error, it'll give me the line number on where my code is, uh, where it's running to the error. So that's what that one is there with the arrow pointing to it. Is that exclusive to Jupyter or is that pretty much the case in any, um, I don't know, portal for lack of knowing what to call them, any kind of thing that you're interacting with like REPL or anything? Yeah, this where, is where this that... is kind of like, I mean, sometimes, you know, online REPLs even have ways to decode these and make them even more descriptive for you. Um, but this is standard Python output. You'll see, you'll see like uh, an error like this whenever it occurs, uh, no matter how you run that Python code. So it'll typically be a trace back. And, and a lot of times you'll see like 500 of these pop up at once. If you have something happening in, uh, if you have something happening in, in one cell and then it triggers an error, in another one, and it kind of goes back. That's what this trace back is. It's just showing, you know, the, all the errors and it gives the most recent one last. So you can kind of see where the source of your error is. So reading these is a skill in itself. Uh, a bit outside the scope of of quick pass. Uh, even though you will be introduced to these, uh, you'll you'll see all sorts of errors, uh, and um, you know they're all fairly descriptive. Some are kind of cryptic, uh, and if you have an error, if you if you're doing your own coding and you run into a weird error and you don't know what it is, put it in our chat. Uh, someone's gonna be able to help you uh, work through it and figure out the error. So again, it's another good use case for the chat. Um. And also uh, in Slack, if you don't know how, you can add little code blocks uh, in there. Um, if you if you take whatever you're trying to type in like code format, if you just use a back tick uh, in in the uh, in the Slack window and put your and put your code in there, it'll whenever you whenever you put the other the closing back tick, it'll all turn orange or you know you may have a different color in your Slack, but It'll turn to like that 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 nicely formatted code so others can see it. So that's just a, a thing on Slack that uh, can help you kind of relay code without just putting it in plain text. Uh, makes it easier to copy and paste into my own IDE so I can run it. So any questions so far on the initial you know Boolean values and expressions intro? Okay. All right, let's move to comparison operators. So we already saw one of the comparison operators up here. Uh, when I when I introduced like this, this x greater than 40, uh, that is one of our comparison uh, operators. And that's how we can uh, build Boolean values with these uh, comparison operators. So we have several of them. Uh, and most of these you should be familiar with uh, from either math class going through that and, uh, you know, through high school. Um, you have your greater than, uh, greater than equal to. So it's not like a greater than with a line underneath it. You kind of just put, you mash both of them together, uh, less than and less than equal to. Of course, the less than faces the other way. Uh, equal to, though, uh, if you remember the single equal sign, which we have right here, a single equal sign is the assignment operator. So when I when I do that, I'm saying, hey, I'm I'm designated a spot in my computer memory as false uh, as this variable. So, um, but when you do this, you're actually comparing something. And so uh, this one is equal to, and then the exclamation point and the uh, equal sign is not equal to. So that's the the opposite of it. So you, when you compare it, whenever something is not equal to the other side of the, the operation, uh, it would evaluate to true. So uh, in this case, if you look at the example right here, right? So 23 is equal to 32. We all know that is false. We run it. It's false. Um, if I were to take this, and then, of course, conversely, 
make it not equal to, and let me run my environment, that equals true because 23 is not equal to 32. That expression evaluates to true. Um, and we can do, uh, you know, we can we have some examples of the other ones down here. So here, I'm actually making a Boolean expression. And then the result of that expression is what I'm assigning Boolean 1 to. So my Boolean here, uh, Boolean 1, is going to be equal to whatever this is, right? Uh, if you look at it, you can say, well, uh, it says 450 is less than 350. Well, we know that is false because 450 is greater than 350. So we get false. And now Boolean 1 is equal to false, and we can use that later. Um, we can also assign our variables. So here we have num num1 is equal to 8, and then num2 is equal to 6. And then we can run our comparison operator there with just the variable names. And there we go. Num1 is 8, and num2 num is 6, and num1 is greater than num2. Uh, so it is true. Any questions on that? Awesome. All right, our next section is membership checks. So this one here is, uh, they're words. They're not even, they're not gonna be the, the arithmetic symbols that we have. Um, in this case, we have the word in and not in. If you notice, again, I'm using it right here that it shows up as this weird color. It's not the same color as like my, my uh, definition because this is a special case. This is a special reserved word uh, in Python uh, that's only used for comparison or for membership checks. And so what it does is the, the in operator checks if the left side expression is contained in the right side expression. A lot of times you'll be using this uh, for collections so in this case, I have a list uh, of years that St. Louis has gotten a blizzard. Um, and I want to see, okay, well, it was 2017 a blizzard year. So I want to write 2017 in St. Louis blizzard years. Uh, if I run this, I get false. So I can take a look. I didn't have to look at the list, but I could. But you can see that 2017 is not in there. And it's a pretty long list. Conversely, if I if I wrote the word not and run that, it'll be true because 2017 is not found in this collection. Any questions on that? Okay. We're going to add a little bit of layer of complexity to just, you know, what we just uh, learned here with the in and not in. Uh, also with the, with the uh, comparison operators. And that is the, um, the logical operators. And, and those will allow us to combine two or more uh, comparison operators or membership checks into one final statement to then uh, come up with the result of a logical statement. So in this case here, uh, we have three operators. We have and, or, and then not, which is like negating the value of Boolean statement. Uh, so and will check to see if two statements are both true. And then or checks to see if either of the two statements are true and then not negates the value. Uh, so if we take a just look at this, you know, if we, if we use the word and, then we're, we're being a little more restrictive, right? We're saying we have to meet two conditions, both have the value to true before the whole thing evaluates to true. Or is not so restrictive because it can be, you know, one or the other. And if one or the other is, is uh, values to true, then, uh, we get a true at the end. So uh, in the statement, I have a black dog and I have a brown dog is only true if I have two dogs and one being black and one being brown. 
Uh, the statement, I have a black or brown dog, is true if you have either. So you can have one dog, and that statement will be evaluated true. Uh, so let's take a look at some of these examples here. I have 10, 10 greater than 8, and 23 less than 25. Uh, if I run that, that's true because both of them evaluated the true. Uh, in this example, I have nine in this collection. So I'm using that uh, membership check. So nine in this list or the string W in this main string. So again, I can check for membership in here because a, a string is a collection of characters. It's just immutable. Uh, if we remember from the yesterday's or Monday's lesson that we, you know, strings are immutable. You cannot change them. Lists, you can. We're going to be going over lists tomorrow, but um, that's the difference. They're both collections. So if I, if I run that, it's true because um, one of these is evaluated true. This one did not evaluate to true. But this one did because the the W is right there at the end inside that parent string. So the or statement allowed us allowed this whole statement to value to true because the one or the other was true. So it's not as restricted. And here's the uh, here's the negation. So we have you know boolean two is equal to you know it looks like inside the parentheses four does not equal five. So that is true. And then we're negating it with the word not. So if we ran that, it comes out as false. I have not really used not in practice too often. Um, I know there's a case I can think of. I need to come up with a really good case of, of using this. Just know that you could run into this. Um, but I haven't really used used it much in the code I've written, but um, uh, that is there uh, to negate things and to allow flexibility when you're writing Boolean statements. And so if you look at it, though, if you if you kind of look at all this Python code, it's all pretty easy to read. I mean, it's almost like reading a math textbook, right? So seeing, you know, the word and and seeing the greater than less than, um, and it's easy to read them. And, you know, just like we'd speak it, there is a limitation, and I wanted to um, I wanted to show that here. So in this case, I have I want to say okay, I want to print the results of this statement, and it looks like I have that you know I have that uh, the statement where I'm combining two of them, and I'm going to say okay, well print 2014 and 2018 in St. Louis Blizzard years, and okay, so it came out as true. So both of those are in St. Louis blizzard years. Now, this isn't a very long list, but I can go through it here and get to the CSC 2018, but 2014 is definitely not in there. Um, and so why, why would that happen? Why would, why would that evaluate to true? Because at least one of them are true. Well, no, this is an and statement, so both have to value it to true. Is it because you use the n? Nope. So this this one here evaluates to true. That is correct. And that is a statement on one side. However, this is kind of one of the weird weird pick of those with with uh, with Python and other languages as well. Is I, it's what Python is doing is evaluating that this exists really. Does the term, does this number 2014 exist? Yes. There's no statement. There's no complete Boolean expression on either side of this um, operator. Uh, and so the fact that this exists is true. Um, and the fact that 2018 is in St. Louis Blizzard, that's also true. So I'm even though we would read it this way, we would say, yes, 2014 and 2018 are in St. Louis Blizzard years. We'd read that in English language. But the problem is 
2014 is not there, but this is the and statement. It's because this is not actually looking for 2014 in St. Louis Blizzard years. Um, and I can show you right here, you know, if I print 2014 in St. Louis Blizzard years, that evaluated false. And then 2018 in St. Louis Blizzard years, that evaluated true. But if you take a look at this, when you're comparing things to, to the actual Boolean statement it represents, zero does equal false. What does one equal? One equals true because one does not equal false. Negative one also evaluates to true. And that's where that that is coming from, the fact that it exists. So if I if I change this to true, that is false. So if I change this though, and I put this right here. And ran that. Now I get a false. And the reason I get a false is because I'm actually making a statement to compare. And so this is where it kind of differs a little bit from English. You know, we wouldn't say that, you know, as we read it, like 2014 in St. Louis Blizzard years and 2018 in St. Louis Blizzard years. We would, you know, in English, we would say 2014 and 2018 in St. Louis Blizzard years, but Python does not evaluate that way. You have to have a complete Boolean expression on either side of that operator for it to evaluate correctly. So it doesn't give you an error. It gives you something you're not intending. It's just something you have to be careful of. And so when you're when you're writing when you're writing your expressions, uh, as you get a little more comfortable writing code, um, I've done it. I've totally written something and I'm like, why is that evaluated true? I know it's false. And then I'm like, oh, I didn't finish my statement. So it's just something to think about. Any questions on that? <clears throat> awesome. I have one question. So all the truthy or falsy values that are in JavaScript are same here in Python as well? For the most part, yeah. I mean, you're you're still going to write your evaluations. Um, I know like JavaScript, for example, if you're talking about like comparisons, like uh, right here, right? So um, comparison operators, I know JavaScript has a triple equal and that's a very like strict equality. And then double equal is like, um, is like loose equality where you can have some differences between uh, the things you're evaluating. Um, there are some minor differences from JavaScript to Python, but for the most part, the logical operators, they all operate the same. And like in JavaScript, instead of the word and, it would be two ampersands. So in JavaScript, you would use this in place of um, that. Python does not use a double ampersand. I have one question. Could you scroll up a little bit, please? Sure. So right there, well, right, that means nothing to you. Um, 18 on the left there. One, uh, line one, zero equals true. Why is that showing false? And why did it show false under there for each one of the changes that you made you saw you see how so the fact that it's not so zero does equal false like false is equal to zero um and when you you're comparing like a number the number itself to true or false so so just like you know zero is off and one is on for example when you think about like binary logic the same thing occurs with numbers in python um so it if I run zero equals true, I get false because zero equals false. So um, that's really it. Just same way as the empty list, right? So uh, empty list, 
Oh, empty list does equal, uh, it does not equal true. Okay, so I don't have all of these, <laughs> all of these correct. But um, there is, uh, um, there's like under the scenes, you know, or behind the scenes uh, evaluations happening with Python um, that, yes, like any value other than zero, when you're talking numbers, will equal true uh zero equals false uh with with uh python won't negative one evaluate to false two i believe negative numbers evaluate false nope they equal true uh wait maybe they do equal false yeah so yeah, anything yeah, so anything, any positive number of values to true, then negative number is equal false. Yeah. I'm missing something here. So when you have false to the right there of the equal, huh? um, and you're changing the numbers, why is it still showing false at the bottom? So I was, so negative numbers equal, they do not equal true. So negative numbers equal false. Positive numbers will equal true. Like, but the <laughs> one equals or whatever there is saying equal to, right? What's that? I'll have <laughs> to this out separately because because I'm reading it as one equals true, right? Mm -hmm. It's equal to true. Yep. And unless you change true to false manually, wouldn't aren't you making an expression there? Like if you put negative one equals true, then that would be false. Is that, I'll figure it out later. <laughs> yes. It's probably, I'm probably overthinking it. So, so you are, um, it's again, uh, you typically, you typically won't be doing those evaluations. I, I think I can remember, uh, an article about, uh, truthy falsy statements in Python and how it relates to native data types. I'll see if I can find it and post it so y'all can see it. Um, I really wouldn't think about it too much right now. Um, but the reason that the reason I mentioned this though with the blizzard years is only because uh, you have to think about how Python evaluates like just data types themselves and how, you know, in this case, when I'm when I'm including this with this logical operator here, it's gonna it's gonna want true or false statements on either side of it. And in this case, the fact that 2014 exists as a positive number is going to be true. And so when you run this, it looks like it would be correct. Like, yeah, I mean, I'm seeing both of these are in St. Louis blues years because I'm saying and, and, and then it evaluates to, to true. You're like, oh, cool, it worked. And then you can write other stuff in your script that's completely incorrect based on one of these like test cases you, you, you coded out. And you didn't realize that, oh, wait, you know, that this isn't a correct statement at all. This is just giving me an in incomplete or an, an inaccurate result that I'm not expecting. So um, as you practice these logical operators and you and you add those to the, the two um, statements on the other side, you just got to make sure you write a complete Boolean expression. This being a Boolean expression because it's using the word in. Or a Boolean expression using the um, the uh, comparison operators. These these things right here. So you can use comparison operator or membership check to write your complete statement using your logical operator in between. So this is the correct statement. I kind of wrote it already and changed it, but that one here shows up as false because 2014 is not in St. Louis blizzard years. There we go. Yeah, uh, Lieber put some, uh, uh, put some stuff in the chat. All right, let's move into if statements. Um, 
So these are these are also the bread and butter in co combination with uh, functions. Uh, these are the bread and butter when when writing out code to make decisions, and we're breaking our problems down into those those yes or no questions. We can use these if, else if, and else statements to execute code based on conditions. Um, if we remember a bit about the Python syntax, uh, you see all the, the of course, the if, elif, and else show up as red. Uh, those are reserved words in Python. You can't define those as variable names. Um, you can see the, uh, you can see our uh, comparison operators. Uh, they are uh, also colored. And then we have our data types. Um, our uh, integers are purple and then our variable names uh, and then our 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 Python native uh, methods, they're also uh, green. Uh, but if you look at the syntax here, I have my my first if statement here, and then I have a colon. And so that's important when you're when you're writing um, functions or if statements, uh, you'll end them with a colon. And when you do that, you know you have to invent your next line. So the the Python syntax will uh, lead you to indent and of course um the it's typically four spaces or a tab uh but sometimes you'll see code with two spaces uh just know that you have to indent somehow under the next line for the python code to run if you don't uh it'll throw an error at you and it will not run and so uh let's take a look at this uh this set of if and else if uh statements here we have um our temperature is at 70 and we're saying, hey, if the temperature is less than 32, uh, I want to do something. So at this point, we indent everything and we uh, want to do something. And so we do that for temperature less than 32. Uh, if that evaluated to false, then we, you know, if, and we can already see that, you know, in this, this comparison operator here, we're saying temperature is equal to 70, 70 less than 32. Uh, no, it's not. So let's move to this next line. Python will evaluate that. See if it's true or false. If it's false, it'll just skip down to either the next else if statements or the else statement. Or if you don't have an else statement, it'll just continue running the code after the block. So in this case, I do have an else if statement. So Python will jump to line eight and it will check there. Is 70 less than 55? And nope, it's going to move on. And then say, okay, this is going to be the catch all. It's going to run no matter what else happens. So it, this is what's going to run. So if I run this, 70, of course, looks to be a nice day. It's actually pretty close to our high temperature here today. Um, by the way, I'm in the St. Louis area. Uh, it was a really, really nice day today. <laughs> so, um, But if you notice, in my first condition, right, I have less than 32, but then I put another if statement underneath. And that's that's fairly common practice. If you if you have a certain condition and then you have other uh, conditions underneath to to run, then you can you can indent another if statement inside, put another colon, and then if that evaluated true, you would then run code underneath there. Uh, in this case. Um, if that evaluated not to true, then it would run this print statement if this evaluated to true. So we can test that out here by doing 40. So we start with temperature of 40 and we run that and we ended up on line nine as a result. Uh, the reason being because Python checked this one and 40 is greater than 32, so that's false. We move down here, 40 is less than 55, that evaluated to true. This is where I stopped. So when you're constructing this code, going line by line, starting at four, mm -hmm. you know, it's less than 32. Um, then it goes down to the next one. But why is the print line? So I get why the print line is below if it's less than 10. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. But why is the print line for the first temperature range less than 32? below the print line. And I, I understand the indents and probably how they correlate mm -hmm. with each other, but I'm just trying to understand why it's structured that way. So um, so let's let's take a look what happens. Let's let's see. Oh, because if you put it under less than 32, 
but it was higher than 10 and less than 32. Yeah, I see. It would it would autom it would print both statements. Oh, so look at that. Yep, I still printed that. Do I want that to happen? Well, doesn't hurt in this case because they both warn you to, to stay warm <laughs> and get warm. Right. But so how could, could I fix that? Just simply move it or go back to the way it was before. <laughs> so where, where should I move it? Where are we at? Sorry. If less than 10. Oh, what happened? There Sorry. I'm... All right. So if it's less than 10, print. It's dangerously cold outside. Should that I do it that way? Would that work? No. It's going to print both again, right? Yeah, it would print both again. They just flip them, right? So we just hit this one first. Yep. Yeah, so I get it now. I was just trying to think of the, the logic of how it reads down. And I get it now. Thank you. So, I mean, I want to figure out how, how can we not print this? Like, when our temperature is 9, which is less than 32, do I need to move this completely? And new, make a new else again. Yeah. Okay, so do uh, if and else, and then what would I do with the else? So move this, but do I move this back down here like that? Yeah. And then maybe do like an else here. Um, I guess do nothing. So would I put anything or... I could even probably do this, and this is kind of leading up to what I'm what I'm going to show you here in a minute. Um, I would probably want to just move this up here and then change this to an else if. So if I did this and go up there and then do that, hmm. Wouldn't it still? Oh no, it would stop at the first line there, yeah. Because it is true that it's my it's less than ten, so it would stop print. Yep. Yep. You can do that. Um, and this is this is a case where you want to take a look at your your um your most restrictive case and make sure that kind of goes up first. Uh, if, you, if you're thinking through your problem, you realize you're probably going to have up to four solutions, right? You're like, well, what's the one that's most likely going to happen, right? You don't want that one to go, especially if it includes other results. Like if you're trying to filter out uh, based on certain conditions, you want to kind of think of how you're going to logically put them in that if and else if statement uh, in a way where if one evaluates is true, it also does not evaluate true on the other in the other ones. You don't want to put that the the, the least. You don't want to put the the least restrictive one first, because and especially with if and else if, if you have these, the Python code will stop and will not evaluate these if this one evaluates are true. And this is a case right here, where uh, I have my if and else if statements. Right, I'm saying if temperature is less than 55, okay. If temperature is less than 32, okay, cool. If I run this, right, my temperature is negative 60. You know, I get layer up and stay warm. But, you know, if you, there's no error or anything, but if you, if you look what happened, like this code works, but it's not as I'd expect because I want this one to show up when my temperature is less than 32, but it never does because it ran this and that evaluated true. Temperature is less than 55. So it's going to run this. And I see that I have an else if and L Python sees that and it's not going to evaluate anymore. It's going to stop here. It's going to stop right there and, and say, we're done. 
So do you think about like what, I mean, just using this example, because there's so many possibilities, but um, since you know that more often than not, the temperature is going to be above 55. So that's why you structure it with the coldest first, the next, and then the warmest. That way it kind of evaluates each of those all the way down to, okay, if it's 70, it's going to keep going all the way down until it hits the, the line that's greater than 55. Mm -hmm. So if I do it like this, now, now I see that I'm getting, I'm hitting that one correct. So when you're putting this together, you just got to kind of think what is, what is my uh, most restrictive case, right? What's more restrictive when it comes to weather, right? The weather's not, you know, we see freezing temperatures all the time, but when we're, when we're looking at temperature, when the, when we're considering like warmth and safety, of course, warmer is better and colder is more restrictive when it comes to actually adding layers or just staying inside completely because it's too cold. You know, we want to think about that in the context of this. This is where, okay, colder temperatures, I want to put that, I want to evaluate the coldest temperature first and let everyone know it's literally freezing outside versus it being kind of cool, just layer up and stay warm. So I'm looking at it from like a problem solving viewpoint of like, whether it's temperature or numbers or whatever it is of just looking at your extremes and whether it's a high or the low and planning ahead when you're breaking down the problem to kind of lay it out in the format that it's going to do this. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about the logical breakdown of it and how you would want to structure it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's good to think about. So yeah, just as you see, you'll, uh, um, you know, as you get practice, you know, especially you're going to run code and you'd be like, that's not the result I was intended with this one in my test case. And you'll go back and you'll see, oh, I have my if and else if statements uh, messed up. So um, so here Jason says, are we able to sequence these in the way that makes sense to us and the code still work? Like Michael, my brain wants to start at one end or the other on the temperature and go sequential. Um, I guess I guess I don't know what you mean by sequential, right? So, like, what do you mean by that? Would, would this also be sequential when we're looking at it, you know, going from lowest temperature to highest temperature? When we're, we're comparing our, our running our if and else if statements? Yeah, that, that, that's what I mean is kind of like the way I'm taking it that Michael's saying it is starting either at the lower end, like for example, in the, the last one you had, I believe 10 degrees was the lowest if statement that we had. Mm -hmm. So like if we started at 10, then 32 and 55 or vice versa, and we put them in that sequential order. And as long as the coding of the ifs or else, else ifs are put in there correctly, the code would still work no matter which order of, no matter which order we put the temperatures in, right? Um, so remember, like Python always runs top down when you're running a script. So you have to think about that too. So well, I, I just mean like, say, for example, this one that you're on now, say we wanted to reverse it and I wanted to start with the warmest temperature first, like start at 55, drop it down to 32, drop it down to 10, which I realize all these print statements would also have to correlate to those. And then, yeah, the, then the top would be an if, and then the rest, the else ifs. Uh huh. Then, then would that still give us the same result, even though they're they're ordered differently? No. No. Okay. The reason being is because remember Python runs top down, so Python mm -hmm. will always run from the top of the script down. Okay. Um, and so it's always going to evaluate this one first. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. And yeah. in this case, they're all true, technically, but it's going to stop at the first line. Right. And Python will see that. You know, it's going to evaluate that these are all if, else if and else statements. If this is true, then it's going to stop because it doesn't need to evaluate the others. So you want to, for, for logical progression down the lines of code, you want to kind of look at your extreme first. Mm -hmm. Most restrictive. Yep. When it, when it comes to weather in particular, especially like... 
that's why you put the minus 10 first or less than 10 first and then work upwards. And, and I was thinking what Jason was kind of thinking initially of like thinking about probability. Like if, if we're measuring weather in Hawaii, is it ever going to be below 55 degrees, you know, and just starting with a 55 up top so that it runs faster and gets to that line first. But then I realized, well, you kind of kind of cover the extremes first and order yeah. and progression in case it hits one of those. But Well, I mean, just think about the high temperatures, right? So, what, I mean, extreme heat can be bad, too. So if we were to write this to, to you know, consider, you know, high heat, then we want to start with the highest temperature and say if our temperature is, you know, greater than or equal to 110, then don't ever go outside. If it's between 95 and 110, it's really hot outside, so be careful. And then anything less than 90 or whatever is, you know, it's hot, but it's okay. Like, for example, you would start with your most extreme and then work your way down with the Python code. So, uh, Jacqueline has a good question. So, once it completes the command, then it stops. Um, so, with in the case of if L, you know, if LF and else, yes, if you have it structured like this, once it finds a statement that values to true, it's going to run whatever is indented and then stop. It will not run anymore. Um, if I just had more if statements, then it will run all of them and evaluate each one. So in this case, if I ran that, I will get all three because they <laughs> nine is is less than all of these numbers. So it will run all three. So that adding the L else if in there makes it stop whenever it evaluates to true. Is Elif going to be a Python specific way to do it versus else if? Correct. JavaScript is else if. Okay. Yeah. So Juan says, would there be any use case to print out more than one statement, like a switch statement without a break? Um, yeah, I mean, if you have a series of if statements, sometimes you do. Like if you if you want to your code to to run functions on a condition that you have, but you know you want them all to run based on you know whatever case you have. I haven't thought of a case. Maybe I can kind of think of one um, for a future class. Or you know, I, let me get back to you on that one. You know, I, I I know I've written code before that that evaluates several if statements and will run functions based on you know the conditions it's in and. Uh, because I need to run them all, I, I just I just can't think of anything right now off the top of my head. That time. would it yeah. would it be like um, talking about weather again? Maybe you're measuring multiple variables. Maybe you're measuring temperature, um, air pressure, and wind yeah. speed. Yeah, yeah. You so you're so maybe they're not you know totally like on the same thing. So if you're you know if you just want to check to see you know if you have good weather, right? So if temperature is greater than fifty five, if rain is you know if it's if rain is is not raining or you know whatever right then you know it would run through and then you have a good day you know at that point so yeah there's there's all sorts of ways to structure it and you'll see and, and i recommend just play with it uh uh you're not going to break anything especially running these uh the containers if you're running like github code spaces but even on your own computer you're not going to break anything so um I think that's probably a good stopping point. Uh, you know, I think we covered all these. We're going to get into Python functions after this. So let's go ahead and take a 10 minute break uh, and come back at uh, 7.05. I'll pause the recording. OK. All right, welcome back, everybody, from the break. Um, you know, before the break, we we talked about uh, Python conditional statements, and we went over uh, some some logic branching with if and else if statements, and using those uh, using those comparison operators and and membership checks uh, and the logical operators to uh, to to allow Python to make decisions. And if we just remember that when Python you know, runs from top down in a script, we want to make sure we structure our if and else if statements that way. 
uh, and, you know, use our problem solving skills to think, you know, think through a problem first and then, um, you know, well, in this case, when I'm trying to evaluate this, I want to make sure I'm looking at the most restrictive first and then uh, work my way down to my catch all statement if I have an else statement. Uh, and just remember, you know, sometimes you just want to check a unique condition. You can have just an if statement by itself. And it will check, evaluate. And if it's true, it'll do its special thing. If not, the, the script continues. Uh, so you can have that as well. And I've used that quite a bit in my code. Um, but we're going to move on to functions. And uh, in the pre-course, if y'all have taken a look at that, uh, that's where I kind of introduced the concept of a function. And I, I put this exact example in the pre-course. But one of the things to think about with functions uh, is that they allow you to logically structure your code uh, in a way that makes it more readable. And um, you know, when I started learning about functions, you know, when I was when I was when I was learning Python, and this was back in 2019, um, it took me a bit to figure out like what's going on with you know with with functions and how can I make it work. But once you know, once it clicks you'll understand what, what makes them so powerful. And there, there's a couple of reasons why they're so powerful. Uh, one, it allows you to kind of, it allows you to structure your code to where things have certain responsibilities and you never really have to think about them again. Um, and uh, that's one of the, that's one of the big ones is, you know, when you, when you write a function, you're, you're basically, you know, you're kind of abstracting away what's happening in the function because you just want to get a result. So just like, you know, if you think of a function uh, as like a car factory, right? You know, you, uh, or even a store, right? So you go, you, you go to a grocery store to eat groceries. And you know that if you, if you give the grocery store, you know, you have to walk through the grocery store, but you can use delivery, right? You, you want to give them your money and the list of things that you want. And then they do their thing inside. You don't care how they get the groceries. You don't care, you know, what's happening inside that grocery store. All you care about is giving them money in the list and then you get your groceries. You don't have to think about what's going on inside. And that's exactly what functions are. Um, but functions are everywhere. Like in my example here, I have Microsoft Word. Like Microsoft wrote Microsoft Word like with just a bunch of functions. It's a bunch of files of functions and they everything you do when you click each button, when your mouse moves, when you put your cursor somewhere, when you hit an arrow key, they're all handled by those functions inside the program somewhere that you don't see. And they're all they're all driven by functions. Like, you know, when you have a you have a spacebar click or or anything, you know, they'll have a function, you know, handling each one of those those actions just like on in web development the same thing when you hover your mouse over something like in visual studio code when i hover my mouse over this and i see this like highlight there's a function driving that somewhere behind the scenes for it to display on my screen um so um when you're writing a function you initially have to think about how all that stuff works so you're it's like when you're writing the grocery store function you have to write like, okay, when I get money and a list of these items, I have to go get these items. I have to, you know, I have to know these are vegetables and these are canned goods and these are, you know, desserts. And I have to know how to grab those and get them in. But the person who's calling the function doesn't care what's happening. And so, um, and whenever you have hundreds of functions, you start to see that when you're looking at a program as a whole, you can't think about what's happening in all those functions all the time because it's just too much. So you want to abstract those processes out to these blocks of code that operate the same way and they behave a certain way uh, based on what you're giving it. So um, if you look at the structure of a function and uh, um, I introduced these in the pre-course, uh, I'm defining a function here. And this is where I put function is defined here. Um, I'm making a function. If you notice that like the print statement also shows up as green as this because the print statement in Python is a function or method. Method and function can be used interchangeably. Uh, there's a bit of a difference, but you can in the in the, the the context of this course. But we have our function name, 
And then it has these parentheses, if you see here, and then a colon. So in the parentheses, I have these two things. One is called target name and one is called input data. And what these are parameters. And um, when I'm writing a function, I'm writing my function to always take two parameters. And if I don't give it two parameters, then when I try and call it, it's going to give me an error. So this is just like the grocery store. So define grocery store, okay? Money and grocery list. And basically, if you try and go to the grocery store and just give them money, you know, they may just take it, but, you know, they're not going to know what to do. Like, here's my money. They're like, cool. Like, what do you want? Right? So in this case, uh, in my find name function, I want a target name and I want my input data. And then you can you can see kind of what target name and input data as you write a function, you're gonna you're gonna have an idea of what the format of that stuff is, right? Um, but in this case, right now we don't know what it is. And then inside the function is all the inner workings, what's happening inside that function. Once I complete my function. And I and I've gotten that return statement in there, right? And I and I think it's good. I don't have to think about what's happening inside the function anymore if I wrote it correctly. And so I have my function, I have my parameters, um, and I have what's happening inside the function, and then I have a return statement. So this return statement it says, "Hey, this is what comes out of the function." Uh, in this case, it looks like what comes out is a Boolean statement and it's going to be true or false. And so um, if you take a look at the other data, so I have my function here and then I, and I, you see everything under the function is indented, but then I go back to not being indented. So this is outside of the function. And what this is, this is just a, a long string of data and it has a bunch of names in here. And, um, and then below that, Here's where I call my function, okay? If you notice, I have find name written right here, which is the same as the function name, and I have the parentheses, and then I'm feeding it data. So this is just like in the grocery store, the money and the list. And in this case, um, the, 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 the way the function is you know written, what it's doing is it's assigning target name to whatever I put in here. So that's my name. I put it as target name. And then long string of data, which is defined right here, is the other parameter that I'm calling. And so when this function runs, target name becomes Aaron Wood, long string of data becomes input data. And then now with those two things defined when it runs, I can actually see something happen. And so, um, and inside the function, what I'm doing is I'm I'm establishing a new variable called present and I'm making it equal to false. So I'm establishing it as a Boolean. And then I'm making another variable called name location. And what I'm doing is I'm I'm using the find method inside of input data to find my target name. And just like we know with, with strings, because we learned about string methods uh, on Monday, the find method will either return the index of the the first you know the first item that it finds if it finds it or it returns it at negative one. And so I I'm defining that I'm running the find method and it's going to come back with either some number or negative one. And so I'm saying hey if if that ends up being not negative one, then I know they're in the list and then I'm going to return true. And that's exactly um, that's exactly what should happen here. So I have the actual function written down here, and um, so I have the same exact function, and I have my long string of data. And then if you look here, I've done it three times now. I've, I've, it looks like I'm actually calling the function three times. I've only written it once, but I can call it several times. I don't have to worry about thinking about what's in the logic. I can start giving it names to know who's in the list and who's not. And if I run that, now I know that Aaron Wood is in the list. I can't even see the list, it's off the screen. Bill Smith is also there somewhere, but James Randy is not. James Randy is not in the list of, or not in the list, it's in the string of names. So 
James Randy is not in there. I don't have to look at the list because I wrote my function to do that for me with the find method. So negative one represent again. So um, let me show you. So I can uh, you, I can throw a print statement in here to kind of see what happens, right? So I can say print. I can do like this. This is the result of the. Uh, let's do find method. And then I can make it name location. So here, this is the result of the find method on the first one, and that's at index 108, because that's where Aaron Wood is found. If you look over here, there it is. And then uh, the second time this function gets called, it goes back and it runs the function again. So it prints again. And this time I found it at index 13. Well, Bill Smith is right here. So this is index 13. And then James Randy's not found. So I get back a negative one. That makes sense. Thank you. Yep. Uh, I believe negative it's... one is just another way of saying not found, right? Correct. Okay. Yep. And so um, in this case, you know, if you look here, I'm actually not even using my variable present, right? So I'm saying, hey, return true, uh, otherwise return false. So I, I kind of, I don't even need this in here, right? Um, or I can just say uh, return present else. I don't even need that. I don't even need that really. Uh, I can say present equals equals uh, true. There we go. That's how it was in the example. Um, so in this case here, I'm actually using my variable now that I established as false. Um, and the only way it's true is if it's not negative one. So remember that, you know, from the lesson a little bit earlier to you know in the lesson here, um, this is one of those, this is one of those uh comparison operators. I'm saying name location. Uh is it is it uh negative one or not? So they say, is it not negative one? Uh if that's true, then I know what's in the list and I want to make present equal to true. So I'm kind of flipping a switch on the present variable, and then I'm returning it. If this does not evaluate to anything, it's just going to skip it, and and present will still be false at that point. So ends up being the same thing. Any questions on how that function works? You see, I can just call this all day. I only wrote it once, but I can call it all I want on new strings of data. I can I can give it new strings of data. I can give it new names. I can do whatever I want. This is just a, a way to search through a collection and find a target. Um, to, to note about the return statement, some functions don't have return statements. Uh, you Ideally, you do want to have some, your function return something, but you don't have to. Um, you know, if you just want a function to run to do something and then return nothing, um, when you when you omit the return statement, it will return none, that none type. Um, so that's just something to, to remember is you don't have to have a return statement, but it's typically good good practice to have some sort of return statement uh, at the end of your uh, function uh, just for readability. Okay, in this function here, we have our multiply function. And so I'm making a function, it's not very big, it's actually pretty small, uh, but we have, we're defining new function and we're, this is where we define it. We have our name multiply, and then we have two parameters, A and B. Uh, and then 
when we actually call the function, this is where we're calling it. And we're actually giving A is equal to four and B is equal to three. And we're defining the result of that function as result. So when it returns, when it returns this operation, that's what gets to find the result. And then I print it. So if I run that, that's what I get back. If I did three and three, then I get nine because it's just returning whatever I want to multiply. Any questions on functions? Ah, so that's a good question, Yi. So what if you put a different data type as in the argument? Well, if I put a, like a string, Because three, the string three times the number three, I'm gonna, I just, I just concatenate that three times. If I did 15, I'll get 15 threes. Um, that's a good question, Amber. So is it best practice to assign a variable as a Boolean value? Um, I would say yes, especially if you're trying to make your code descriptive of, as to what it's doing. Um, in this case, right, so if we go back to this, this function that I had up here, right? The reason I use the word present is because this is like a classroom, like attendance, right? So, uh, in this, you know, it could be this case. and. You know, what I'm saying is this person is present in the list. So that's why I made it present. It was being descriptive as to, you know, what what we're getting back. Um, but how I had it written before, where it's if name return true, otherwise return false, that is completely fine, too. You'll see code written either way. Um, but, you know, I would say, yeah, yeah. So for code readability and also to make your code not as brittle. So uh, in that case, it really wouldn't change how brittle the code is. But if you don't use variables and you try and hard code a lot of things, and I think I have a, a section on that in the pre-course. Um, if you don't include variables, uh, your code will become less, uh, it, it, it's not as easy to change the operation of the code. Um, and I do have some examples of that later on um, uh, in in the course. And I can also show you some examples of that. But you always want to try, especially when you're writing code, you, you want to try and have everything as a variable um, just so you only have to change it in one spot versus changing it in several spots. So, uh, so let's move on to function scope. So, um, functions are like little mini programs that we, that, you know, house functionality that we don't have to think about. Um, all we care is we give it something. We, we, we say, okay, here's the function. It requires these two things. Okay. I have these two things. Here they are. Please give me your output. That's all you have to worry about. Um, but what happens inside of a function is limited to staying inside. And so here's a kind of a, almost like a useless function, <laughs> uh, if you will. Um, but I have some variables identified here. And then like I have an unused variable. Um, I think I was using that in a prior class, but we can still we can still uh, take a look at it. So, but you know, I'm, here's my function. You know, I even put a comment in here saying function defined here, right? So I'm, I made a function called number processor and it takes in three parameters this time, not just not just two. And I have um, number one, number two, and then the operation. And so you can think of this as probably like a little calculator, uh, right? But 
um, inside of the function. So when inside the function scope, um, I have some stuff happening, right? Uh, in this case, it looks like, you know, I have unused variable at 999. Okay, cool. Um, and then next thing that happens, is I have number number one is equal to nine, uh, which is kind of weird to redefine something inside of a function. And then I have a bunch of if and else if statements. I'm saying if operation is the plus sign, then my result equals num1 plus num2. Okay, so it looks like I have some operations happening. If I give the operation as a string, it'll do something. Okay, cool. Here, right. Um, What's up? In there. Uh, did you have a question? Calling. I'm sorry. I think he was calling his kid or his dog or something. Uh, okay. Okay. Cool. Right. Yeah. Um. So, so it looks like it's like a calculator type function. Okay. Cool. Anyway. Uh, we'll 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 move on and see what we're doing here. So I'm going to say, okay, so this I'm printing a statement and I'm using that formatted string and I'm saying this is a result. So um, this is a lot of this is probably the most code you've seen. If you if you're not familiar with coding, you're like, wow, that's a lot of stuff. And I don't know what to think about, right? But just remember, when we, if we're, when we start this cell. Uh, when we run this cell, we're going to start from the top down, and so Python's going to start here. And say my number equals five. Okay, cool. I have a variable my number five. My other number is six. My operation is the minus sign. Okay, and then I, it's establishing an unused variable at thousand. Cool. And then it's reading a function. Says so cool. Here's a function. Um, here's a function here. And then um, now it's going to go over here, and so it knows the function is defined, but it hasn't been called yet. So it's not going to do anything inside this code until it gets called. So now it's going to go here and then print this out. So it's going to see that print. And then here is where the function is called. Number processor. See that? This is where the function is called. And looks like my number is the first, is num1. My other number is num2. And then my operation is num, is the operation. So, oh, okay. So it's these things that are defined here are getting put into number processor. And then... I'm running that, I'm getting a result, and uh, then I'm going to, I need to make this a little bigger so we can see everything. There we go. Um, and then I'm going to print my number. I'm just doing some other things to, to print. Okay, cool. So if I run this, let's see what we get. So I get, this is the result of number processor on five minus six. I get three. Well, that's a, that's a cruddy calculator. I get three. So why why would I get three? Why wouldn't I? I should get negative one. And then it looks like it says my number is five. My other number is six. Okay, so it looks like it looks like that's that's right. So what happened here? Why why would I get three? Where's your operation? So the operation uh, is my operation. It's defined there. And then I'm actually putting my operation as operation. So it, when I call the function, that's where it goes. Five minus six. Well, why is it you define number one, one is equal to nine? Uh -huh. Yeah. So it looks like I have number one. I, I redefine it as nine in here, um, which makes no sense, right? I shouldn't do that because then I'm kind of destroying the, the whole point of the function, unless I need to change it, right? So you may need to change the function, but if I comment this out, uh, let's not do that. Let's try that again. Um, what did I just do? I just copied over, didn't I? Okay, there we go. Um, so if I comment this out, there we go, and I run it again, oh, okay, so now I get the right result, okay? And if I change this to a, like a, a, a multiplication, then I get five times, six is 30. So it looks like that's that's running. So yeah, um, but the whole point, the whole point of this is that there is a, 
there's a scope, right? Um, I fed in my number, and whenever I gave my number as number one, inside the function, my number became number one, and I changed it to nine. So I changed it to nine, but then when my function was done running and I printed my number, it never changed. It was back to whatever it was. It was back to five. Because inside the function, I uh, I can't really change stuff that was fed into it. I can't change it um, on the outside. And I can't change it on the inside uh, from the outside. So, um, again, yeah. I'm calling that a useless function because I was changing the input parameters and defining it to a static value. But you can change the variable inside the function, and it's unchanged outside. Why? Why would you change it inside the function? You you normally wouldn't. You would do stuff with a with a variable to to kind of process it, but you wouldn't just change it to a static value. The reason I was doing it is just to show scope. I was changing what my number was because I was feeding into here, but inside the function it was called number one. And I was changing it, but I never actually changed my underscore number. And so that's what I was illustrating with this with this scope is inside the function, I can't really change stuff um, on the outside uh, because I have scope. Um, also, and this is another way to look at it, anything defined inside the function is only accessible inside. So in this case, I have my function here. And look, it doesn't take anything in. I just want to run my function when I call it. So inside my function, I'm defining x is equal to 10. And I print 10 inside the function. But if I try and run print x out here, Python has zero idea what I'm talking about. So this ran, printed. I printed x right here. And you notice it doesn't have a little squiggly line underneath it because x is defined inside the function, inside the scope. But once the function is called and it's done, outside of that, if I look at x, x is not defined. And so that's why this raised an error, because this is the function definition. This is where I defined it. This is where I call it, but this is completely outside the function. So once the function is done running, Python forgets what X is because the function's done. And so if I try and print X, uh, it has no idea what I'm talking about. So that's really function scope uh, at the most basic sense. So, um, well, actually, most of my examples, Amber, that's a good question. I do try and do a return, right? Um, so I'm printing stuff outside of a function, but I do return. In this case, I did not return. Because this also illustrates that you can run a function and not return anything. What does this function actually return if I omit the return statement? It returns none. And I can print my function, and I believe... Let me comment this one out because I don't want to see an error. If I ran that, I get none. That's what my function returned without a return statement. I got none. Um, but in this case, I'm just using to illustrate that you don't have to return a statement. So um, just in this case, I wanted to print while well, I was still inside the function and print X as I defined it inside the function outside the function I wanted to um, pr try and print X when Python doesn't know what it is. That's why I got an error. X is not defined on line six. It's defined inside the function. And so I did want to kind of show this as well. Um, if I can go here. Uh, I'll pull the website here in a second. 
this is a cool little site to take a look at um, when you want to see code run. Wait, I mean, you can use debugging steps in Visual Studio Code, but I find this to be a little easier, especially when just learning and putting in small functions. So this is this will visualize how code runs as you typed it out. So I just put the stuff I had on my Visual Studio Code, and now it's going to break it down to seven steps. So Python took seven steps to come up with the error. In this case, I'm defining a function, and you see Python behind the scenes says, okay, I have a function called my function, and I will be ready to run it whenever it's called. And then, oh, I call it. So I call my function here, and it doesn't require any parameters, so I don't give any. And so it goes into my function. So you see how the code went down, but then it had to go back up to the function because I called it. So now it's on line one. And it goes into line two, and it defines x as 10. So inside the scope, not the global frame, inside the function frame, x is equal to 10. And then I run a print statement and the print output says and print inside the function. Well, I'm printing X. Well, X is equal to 10 in that print statement. But then when I'm done with a function, I go to print X. X is no longer there. The, the function frame is gone and Python does not see X. And so it's like, I don't know what that means. X is not defined. What's the site? Is that pythontutor.com? Yep. And it will does JavaScript as well. So yeah, this this uh, this site is really useful. I use it a lot when I was learning Python because you know I had a hard time myself grasping. Like I get that this is running, I just don't see where the error is happening. This helped me find errors. Um, I think you're limited to about a thousand line of code, a uh, thousand lines of code, or a thousand operations. So if you have a a big loop that's running or something, and you know you go over a thousand steps, it'll just kill it and say your your script is too big. Um, so just keep that in mind. Most of the stuff you're going to be seeing in this course is, is super small, so you should be able to use it in Python Tutor to kind of see how the code runs. Um, but yeah, let's actually, let's throw this into it because I, I you know this will help us see how this runs. So we can go here. We can edit the code. Throw that bad boy in there. There we go. So now we can see how this runs. We have 28 steps of this one. And so we start, you know, the comment's not read by Python. So it looks like it's starting in line two. And line two is just saying, hey, I found a function named find name. Cool. Uh, if someone calls it, I'll go back and evaluate it. And so it goes to line 10 because that's really the next line of code that Python is going to go to. And then it, okay, so now I have in the global frame, I have a, a, a a string called long tree and data, and it's a giant string with all the names in it. And then, oh, now I'm going to be calling a function. So I want to print, I want to print whatever the result of this function is. So um, it's going to run the function first. And then when the result, when we get the result, it'll print it out. So I'm going back into find name. I'm going to start looking through it. So uh, it's going to look for that. It's going to define inside the function scope present as equal to false. Uh, and then it's going to run the find. Uh, it does find it at uh, index 108 um, and then print that. So it's going to, in the output, say this result of the find method, 108, cool. And then does name, is name location not equal to negative one? Yes, because name location is equal to 108. So it's not, it's not negative one. So that's true. So we're going to change present to true and then return it. Return value is true. Then it prints it. Boop, there it is. And then it goes to the next one, does the same thing. Boom, boom, boom. Finds 
Bill Smith at index 13, and then returns true as well. And then the last one, James Randy goes through. Present again is false inside the function. The find, the find method found a negative one. If name location is not negative one, it skips that line because that evaluated to false. And then I return present, which is false. So James Randy is not in the string. Hopefully that helps you see how functions are used. Python will see you define them, but it doesn't evaluate or go into the function until you call it. Um, and so if you just think about a function as, you know, you know, you have all sorts of black boxes you operate with, you know, you know, you know, if if someone was a banker, like I just know that I tell the bank teller my account number and I give them my signature you know, and tell them how much I want to withdraw, like they magically get the money and give it to me, like, you know, from my account, they deduct it from my account. Um, how they deduct it from my account, you know, using what method in their computers, I don't care. I just want my money. Um, just like a store, uh, which I already talked about grocery store. I don't care how they organize the stuff or how they collect all the stuff. All I care about is I give them my list, I give them my money, they give me my groceries. Um, so that's how you have to think about functions. You're building those functions and you're building the process, but you only have to build it once. And then you can call it as many times as you want and not have to think about that anymore. So, and you'll you'll actually see, you know, as you get more into development with functions, you'll want to have what's called a doc string, which is a, um, doc string is a, is a way to describe what, what the function takes in, like the format of the data coming in, and then what the expected result is, and if it returns any errors. Uh, so they get bigger, and there's a lot more stuff in there, but we're keeping them simple right now. So, um, so Yi asks, why wouldn't you have defined the present variable outside the function? Um, I really didn't need to, um, because I really don't, like, I always want it to be false before it evaluates a name because if it doesn't find the name, then it doesn't change it. And so I return it. So uh, that's why I just say, let's keep the func let's keep the, the variable inside the function scope so I don't have to worry about that interfering with anything outside of the function. Because if I had several functions um, or several, several functions and other code going on, um, if I don't need that variable outside the function, then I, I really don't want to put it out there. I want to keep it in the scope of the function. That's really the only place I'm going to, I'm going to use it is inside the function. So um, that's why I did it that way. Cool. All right, so we talked about that. We talked about that. All right. Ah, so here's the so here's the print statement. So um, you know, we had a question about the print statements. You can use print statements uh, as a way to debug. Um, I I still do. Uh, I I should probably like just really use the debugger inside my IDE, but I just don't. I typically just do print statements as I see what's happening. So if you're if you're if you're uh, if your function is uh, a little more complex and it has several steps and you want to make sure it's, you know, as you're writing it, you want to make sure it does what you uh, want to do. You can throw some print statements in there. So uh, in this case, um, I have some in here. So I have a, a function. So let's think about this from the context of Python running top down. Okay, I present my, I hit play on this. It's going to see that I have a, function called complex calculation and it takes two parameters cool python will evaluate that whenever i call it oh in line 12 it goes on like oh you're calling it okay cool so it says complex calculation and i have a negative two and a 30 so negative two becomes x 30 becomes y these aren't very good variable names but they are in this uh in this case because i just want to keep them simple and for illustration purposes only uh Inside of the complex calculation, um, 
I'm saying, hey, my product equals X times Y. And then I'm doing some other things to product. I'm not, I'm not done. I'm, I'm redefining as I do other things to it. But in this case, it initially equals X times Y. And then I want to print, see what happens after I do that. And so um, let's go ahead and play this. I say, okay, well, X times Y. In this case, the intermediate result is 60. Okay, cool. And then I want to make the absolute value of that. I want that to be equal product. And so um, that becomes 60. And then I see the result after that other step. So, so after line four, I can see that now 60 because that's what absolute value does. It just gets rid of the sign in front of it. And then um, I'm saying, okay, well, if now I'm doing my, my logic checking. If product is less than 55, does not meet threshold. Otherwise, it meets the threshold and I return it. Um, so it meets the threshold. And so if I, I can change, I can add more calculations so I can... Um, I can go ahead and do a, um, let's just do a, let's just do a one. And if I run that, uh, now it does not meet the, meet the threshold because it's less than 55. Um, so in that case, in this case, it does not meet threshold. Like, but what I'm, what I'm showing is I'm showing these intermediate you know, steps to make sure my function is running correctly. So I have 30 and then after the other step, this this is this being the other step, absolute value doesn't change because I already had a positive number and that equals the absolute value. So that was just a case. I use print statements to kind of see what's going on with the code as it's running. Uh, you can do the same thing with Python Tutor. You can throw a function there and call it and see how it works inside every step. You can use debugger uh, inside Visual Studio Code um, and do the same thing. You can make a stop. You can hit this little red button and it'll make a stop point where you can step through the code. Uh, and when you run it, um, I'm not going to show that functionality here, uh, but you know you can do that. So you can use print statements. You can use um, you know Python Tutor. You can use the debugger if you want to. So the print statement here just helped me monitor the progress of that complex calculation. Uh, function. So any questions on functions? We are nearing the end, so we'll have about an hour. Uh, so I think what we can do is spend the last 10 minutes for a break on this exercise. And then also after the break, we can maybe look into some other functions. I can probably find some other examples that we have uh, and we can go over those. So uh, let's take a look at this exercise. And if anybody wants to try their luck or maybe we can describe how to do it. It says, write your own function that determines what letter grade prints out when called with a numeric grade as a parameter. So uh, in this case, we want to call letter grade with a parameter of 75, and we should get back a C. So just like you think about it, I want the function, I just want to give it a, I want to give it a number and I want it to give me back a letter grade. I don't care how it does it, like when I call it. Now, when I write it, I do care how about, how, it, how it goes about doing it. But once we've written it, we don't care anymore. Um, so it says, remember to define the function first, then call it. So- Do we use a switch statement for this? What's that? Do we use a switch statement? Um, Python does have that has a switch statement now. I know it, it like that functionality just came out as of like a few years ago. Oh, really? Uh, Python typically still a lot of people still write else like uh, if oh. and else if. Okay. Yeah, I've never used switch the uh, the the switch statements. I can't remember what actually what it's called. I have to look it up. I think um, I use it in like Java mostly. <laughs> yeah. Coding with Java. So uh, yes, we can we can talk through this for a few minutes and then we'll go on break. But like, how would I approach this? How can I break this problem down? Um, you know, there's there's one way we can we can break we can break this down. Um 
uh, you know, we can think about maybe writing pseudo code first. So we can, you know, just instead of writing actual code, maybe just writing like, okay, writing your steps down uh, to where, um, you know, you're trying to think like Python, but not necessarily writing Python. Give me one second. Oh, never mind. Here I left. Right. Um, are we including like C minus and A minus and or, or is it just like A, B, C, D? Do you want to? <laughs> I mean, we could. <laughs> what? No. Let's, let's just do letter grade <laughs> first. And then if we want to enhance it, we can. So, um, so if we think about to what we, what we learned, right. So we need to like, well, number one, we need to, and let me go ahead and put a comment. Uh, we need to define our function. Um, and I already kind of have the function name here. Um, so called a letter grade and it takes one parameter. So, okay, so we have letter grade and it takes one parameter. And then what, so let's go inside the function. So let's say we give it a, we give it a parameter. Uh, and what is that parameter? What kind of, what data type is that parameter? Uh, would it be an integer? Yeah, it could be an integer, right? Or it could be a, even a float if we have partial grades, right? But let's just say it's a, it's a integer. So, um, one parameter or one integer parameter. And also, well, let's let's just keep it there because there's a little more to think about. Remember, when we're thinking about Python, we'll, we'll get there. So we have, we define our function called letter grade. Okay, it takes one integer parameter, cool. And so, um, and we want it to, uh, we want it to, to return a letter grade, grade, okay. Based on, based on the value of the integer input, okay. So if we're thinking of that, so we know we want to kind of categorize and we're like, okay, so how am I gonna categorize? Um, so uh, let's go ahead and uh, let's just say we're going to use, we are going to use conditional logic to find the letter grade. Cool. All right. So, um, so we have our like basic like how we want to how we want to get there. And so it says remember to define the function first, then call it. So we have to define the function first. Well, how do we define a function in Python? Def, like D E F. So def. And it looks like we call it letter grade. Okay. And then uh what do we want to call the parameter? Grade. Grade. Okay. And then what else do I do? Colon. Colon. And enter. And if I hit enter, Python, like this ID will automatically indent for me. I don't have to worry about doing it. Okay, so that is that is the initial line where I define a function and now I have to make it a, there's one parameter required and that is a grade. And um then so I have my logic and I want to return return something. So let me just say return something for now. <laughs> um, let's go ahead and stop there and we can resume this. Let's go ahead and take a 10 minute break because I, I have a dog that is extremely hungry apparently because he's outside my door whining. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and feed him. So I'll be right back. Pause recording.
Okay, welcome back from the break. Um, before the break, we stopped. We, we had just started like defining this function called letter grade. And so in this exercise, we're, we're, we want this letter grade to return a letter grade based on a number. And I believe a question was, before we went on break, it was asked uh, about renaming the parameter. Um, and this is something that you'll have to kind of wrap your mind around whenever we, we talk about function parameters, right? So when we call a function, um, so let's say we defined we defined our, our function and now we're below it and we wanna call our function, right? So letter grade, and we wanna give it the, the number 75, okay? When the function is run, we're giving 75 as a parameter to the function. 75, like almost the grade is defined as 75 when this function runs as this. So we don't have to name it. And so inside the function, when I say print grade, right? And then um, I won't return. I'll just do that, right? If I If I ran this, I'm gonna give back 75 because I fed 75 in as grade. So grade became 75. So that's where, again, functions kind of separate, they almost abstract out what's happening inside the function because it's saying, hey, all you have to do is give me a grade. I don't, you know, I just wanna see the result come back out. You know, In this case, I'm just printing it. That's not what we wanna do. We wanna get back A, B, or C but the parameter gets fed into the function and that's what grade becomes. Grade, you know, it's the same thing as saying grade equals 75 or grade is assigned as 75. It's the same thing. Can, can we use, um, I'm kind of looking over here at like the temperature one that we did, uh -huh. but using that in conjunction with and, or, or not but specifically and or, um, and, and I'm thinking about number ranges. Uh, I don't remember if it was James or Jacob that brought up, you know, the, the grading scale of A, B, C, D, F. Mm -hmm. And can we assign it like if it's um, greater than or equal to 71 and less than 79, then it's a C. Oh yeah. So what you're saying is that will that will remove the like restriction, if you will, right? So where you can kind of put them in any order, and it will still effectively run. I see where you're going with that, right? So there's all sorts of ways we can we can uh, there's all sorts of ways we can structure this this uh, function. And it will run. There's there's a hundred different solutions that we can um, use uh, to to get the same result where we're going to get letters. Again, that's the beauty of functions. It doesn't matter. Like I don't like I don't care how it runs. I just want to get the grade back. So yeah, and then to Amber's point, and then do else if it's, and then do the exact same thing on the next line, and give right. it a different number range. But how do you get that to correlate to, um, well, I can visually see it, but I don't know how to explain it. Like one range equals C and another range equals D and so on. Yeah. So let's, let's think about, let's think about how, you know, well, let's, let's just try and, and, and see if we can get through this function and then um, we can think of another way to get through it. So let's, let's start with, uh, here it says Amber says I would use a series of else if statements with the and operator to create a range to return a letter grade. Okay, so let's try and do that first. So let's let's try and return. We know a C right is any is between seventy and it's it's seventy to seventy nine. So we can say if grade is greater than um, or equal to, well, we can just say if grade, yeah, if, if grade is greater than, uh, 69, uh, we can say greater than or equal to, right? Greater than or equal to, 
uh, 70. And grade, we don't want to do and, and then say, you know, less, but that makes sense. We have to say grade again, right? So grade is uh, less than um, 80. So if grade, then I can say result equals C. That's that's the part I couldn't figure out in my head is how do you get it to print the letter grade for that? So yeah. result equals C. Return result, right? So we can start there. Mm -hmm. And so we have one if statement. We say if grade is greater than or equal to 70 and grade is less than 80, we know that it's in that range of C. If, ooh, okay, I got it back. I got back a C. I hit that. Um, so we can maybe just keep building off of this logic, right? So if oh, we can almost like just copy this stuff down and just change it right so i'm gonna do that and then there's just keyboard shortcut in visual studio code uh if you're on a mac you can hit option shift down and it'll just copy uh a line of code for you if you just hit option it'll move code for you through the lines so it's it's very useful when trying to move stuff around so um so, okay, so now we can just say, okay, well, if it's greater than or equal to 80 and grade is less than 90, then that's going to be A, B. And then if grade is, let's do 60 and 70, right? That's going to be a D. And then, oops, I guess I can say if grade is greater than or equal to 90 at that point, and then I can get rid of that. And that's going to be A. Perfect. Yeah, we can have a bunch of if statements, right? We'll evaluate each one if we want to. Um, or we can make them else if. So if it finds one, it'll stop running. That would be a little more efficient. Um, in fact, I don't even have to have that at all, right? I could have... Well, no, I need to have this because if I have anything else at that point, then else return or result equals F, return result. Okay, and so we can just kind of test this out, right? So we can say 83, and that would get a B. Uh, 93, get an A. 55. Mm -hmm an F. It looks like it's working. 110. Get an A. 5. Get an F. Okay. And then, of course, 60, 63, or 65. Get a D. Okay, so we have, it uh, looks like we have somebody else who put something out there. So we can, and you can also uh, put your code, um, you can also put your code in the chat and I can throw it in here and see if it works too. So if you're comfortable sharing code, I, I encourage anyone to do that. So let's go ahead and comment this out. Here is. Yeah, I messed up on the last one. It's uh, it's oh, giving well... me a B if I go a 33. It's time to be writing it right now. 
<laughs> well, I mean, we still try and run it. So we got 85 as a B. And what would you say if it's a... Uh... Now, so if I do like a 33 for like an F grade, it'll give me a B. I like that grade, but, you know, it's not the right math. <laughs> why is that? <laughs> Let's figure out why. Can anybody tell me why? Because if grade is less than... Because it's less than 90. 90. <laughs> then you yeah, got to put a reverse because right. I, I remember like if you do the less than it cancels out the previous one or the first one takes over mm. so you just need to reorder these right so oh. Oop, let me hit that and do the other one so let's see so, yeah this reverses the order of the list so this is where the order matters and the way we did it up the other way, it didn't really matter the order because it was going to only go in that range. So once it found the range, it would work any kind of any order at that point. So, okay, so then less than 90. So now if we ran this, we get an F. 55 is an F. 65. A D. Oh, here's another one. So let's move this one. So here's another another student. Um, let's do grade point. So they called it grade point, and we have percentage. So we can just do a fill a number, right? So 65, run that. Your grade is a D. <laughs> a little emoji. Cool. Why, why did it break that down there? Um, it's, it's got the colon D for a smiley face, right? I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah. Those, are all, those are all different smiley like emojis. Oh, okay. I see. You, you yeah. switched before I, <laughs> I was looking yeah. at the wrong one associated with it. Yeah, they're right there. Okay. Cool. And then, yeah, 55. You fail F. <laughs> cool. Huh. Any questions on that? And that's again like this is these are different different ways you can do it. There's all sorts of ways you can write these these functions. In this case, it was greater than or equal to ninety, greater than or equal to eighty. You know, I use a range in mine, so if it's that, or if it's that, you know, and and staying in a range, um, this allows you to kind of put them in any order, uh, because it's only going to check to see, and if it's not in that range, it'll it'll just move on to the next one. So you can put them in any order. Um, so you know. If you don't do that, you have to start with the most restrictive case and then work your way down. But is either one right? Yes, they're both right. You know, as long what again, would... I don't care about what happened inside the function as long as if I give it a percentage and it gives me back a letter grade that's correct, I'm happy. Hey, so. Aaron, what what would be the most efficient way? Because Python is right is about writing efficiently, is it not? I mean, it it is, but in this such an early stage in like coding i really wouldn't worry about like being efficient because okay. yeah um but in your case i mean this is about as efficient as you're going to get really to, to be honest i mean you have to categorize it so i'm sure you can use some some weird obscure like library or something to help you like eke out you know a millisecond or two in calculation speed, but computers now run pretty fast and we're just doing very, very simple functions just to kind of see how it works. Um, you will in Copatoon though, learn about uh, runtime. So O of N, which is like how functions run or how, how computer programs run. And I'll talk a bit about that when we get into looping because with computers and loops, they're gonna run and you know if your loop you can run efficient loops and you can run not so efficient loops um and you know for stuff we're going to do it doesn't really matter if it's efficient or not and to get into code it doesn't matter how you write loops um 
inefficient loops are kind of easier for beginners to write, which is great because again, if you need to come up with a fast solution, you know, you just want to brute force your way through a, a solution, that's fine. Um, but, you know, any solution is right. We're not going to grade anybody. Uh, I don't grade anything in this class anyway. You know, it's all here for you to learn. I'm here to answer questions. And um, I want to guide you to answers, you know, and learning these basic foundational, you know, concepts of Python. So, but that's that's really it as far as functions go. They're powerful tools for organizing, reusing code. Uh, you'll hear that a lot, reusing code or keeping code dry or don't repeat yourself. Uh, that's what they're for. Uh, they, uh, when we define functions, uh, we can, we can also use functions to call other functions. We can use multiple parameters, um, and we can control the output or see how a function's working by, uh, using return and the print statements. Uh, so, uh, this is your introduction. Um, you're going to see a lot more functions, especially again, when we get into those mini projects, uh, we're going to need functions to divide our code when we're trying to, you know, do things. Um, so that's really it with the lesson. And we can spend the next, you know, th 35 minutes um, going over, you know, maybe exercises that we did. Um, if y'all want, I know we had those, uh, those challenges in the last lesson. Uh, right down here. So these three. Did anybody have any issues with these? Yeah, can you go over the reverse? This one? Okay. And just to keep in mind, uh, when you pull up this REPLIT, right? Um, again, I think the AI is turned on. I, I can't remember how to turn it off. To, to actually code, you can't code in the, the CP like example. You have to fork it over to yours. So, um, I think I already have it forked over to mine, but I'll say reverse problem. Um, let me see, fork REPL. Boop. Okay, so now um, I forked it over to my to my repo, and I can actually edit it. Okay, and so and it was funny, you know, I gave you these problems, and it already started off with functions, and you didn't even learn functions yet, right? So that's now you know. Okay, when I when I Put that stuff in there. I need to put you know whatever whatever I need to put in there under the function name because we're gonna call it. See, it's gonna call it with hello world. It's gonna call my function with this, and it's gonna call my function with that. So, um, so with this one, does anybody have any solutions they had, or did you have any problems trying to get it done? I just couldn't get the punctuation to stay at the other end. I could do uh, the word and reverse the letters, and I can even strip the punctuation away. But I, ain't, I don't, I don't know how to get it back in the same okay. spot. Cool. Well, there's there's several ways we can do that, right? So um, again, using that string slicing and using those indexes can help you. Uh, uh, accomplish that, right? So we want to keep the punctuation at the end. What we can do is we can define a variable as in like, let's say punctuation. Uh, is that you spell punctuation? I think it is punctuation. There we go. Uh, equals str. And then I would say, I mean, it's always at the end, right? So string negative one. Because that would be that would be the end index of it, right? And again, I can always print it, print punctuation, just to check to see. I can run it. Let me see what happens. Uh, punk, punctuation. Punk, oh, it is punk punctuation t. <laughs> That's what happened. Okay, so I it looks like I am printing it out. So there it is. So I have it right. And then I can say, um, let's just say uh, the main string, or well, yeah. So 
I can define it as mainstream or I can, you know, this typically I wouldn't do this, but this is fine for illustrating how I'm breaking my data down, right? Equals uh, str, and I want to take a slice of the string, but this time I want to take from the beginning to up to, but not including the end. So I think that's how I would do a slice of everything up to, but not including the end. Uh, and again, I can print that as well. So print main string. Just see how that works, right? Uh, and I can, if I ran that, I'll get a failure, but it looks like I have hello world. Okay, so it looks like I have it without the, without the punctuation. And I've kind of separated the two things into different variables. Um, and so now all I need to do is um, reverse main str the string, right? And so I can do, I believe it would be another colon and negative one. Let's see what happens when I do that. So print main string. Uh, nope, that didn't work. It didn't give me anything. Okay, let me clear this. How do you clear this? You can clear this, right? Uh, I can never remember how to do this. I hardly ever use... Um, Would it just be colon one, colon negative one? Colon one, negative one? It's like two colon, negative one. Two colons, negative oh, one. Two colon, negative one. run that oh it looks like it's included again though i don't want that you see that so i don't want that i don't want it at the beginning right i want it at the end so then okay so we need to not only so we need to not include it so we need to go like here right and then say and then redefine main string uh, equals main string um, negative, nope, let's try that, negative one, like that, right? And run that. And then I can return. So now I have, so here's what I just did, right? So I... I took out my punctuation and redefined as a variable. So now I have the punctuation separated from the main string um, or the, the this string, right? And then I made a new variable called main string and I just took off the punctuation that I already separated. And so now I have two things called punctuation main string. And then I reverse my main string. So I'm redefining main string as main string in reverse order. And so now I need to put those two together at the end. So um, result equals, um, and let's do it this way. Let's do an F string, because you learned about those, main string, punctuation. And then I can return result. True, true, true. And then I can also print result if I want to see it. So print result. There's hello world with the punctuation at the end. I can also make result equal main string plus punctuation. I think I can also do it that way. Yep, that also works. So remember that plus uh, concatenates, and that would be more the realistic way to look at it. So, or the, the correct way where you have some space between so you can see what's going on. You see how I did that? Yes, thank you. Yep. And so, again, you typically, I mean, when you're actually coding and doing things, you're not going to break everything down into its own variable.
But this helps you kind of go through that thinking process of how am I breaking my data down? How am I using these these uh, methods? Yeah, yeah. You uh, see you later, Rob. Yeah, thanks for attending. So, um, so you, so I'm I'm taking the punctuation out, separating it. I'm taking the mainstream and separating it, and then I'm doing another step and reversing it, and then I'm putting my result, my my, my reverse string plus punctuation together, and then I'm returning it. So it's a very you know step by step procedural. And while that's not the most efficient way to do things in code, right now it's perfect because it helps you see how you're you're breaking the problem down. Cool. Any other questions? I got to run to see you tomorrow. Thank you. All right. Have a good one. You too. Let me see if I have these. Okay. No, I don't have it ready yet. There's a lot of string methods. I can show that later. Um. Yeah, we'll show that with lists. Yeah, any other questions on the lesson today? Functions? Does anybody else want to see another example of a function? Or... um. I'm sure I have some more examples of functions. Okay. Um, so let's see. Uh, let me see what I have here. Let me go to my, I think I have, um, Let's just go to the um, this one again. Let me see if I have. Did y'all do exclamations? Oops. Right. Okay, so again, here's a... Uh, again, the REPL, like, here are the, um, here's the function that we're writing. And the, and the the word pass in here, you'll see this a lot, especially with uh, exercises like this, um, where when you write, you want to write a function, but you don't, you know, let's say you're kind of thinking about, okay, I know I'm going to need at least three functions to do this stuff. Like, you'll just kind of write out the name of the function, put a pass in there. That way, it, Python doesn't give you an error when you run it. It just... Will evaluate them and then you know basically it does the comparison and it sees if you know what it is what the result of the function is if it's equal to what it's supposed to be. So if you take a look at how this is actually working, um, we have our function right. So we're running this code; it's still running top down, but you know they gave us a a look like a skeleton function that has no functionality in it at all. It's just passing. So. Python is actually starting on line six and it's saying, okay, I want to print something. I want to print the result of this function and what the expected result is. And the expected result is remove all ex exclamation part, uh, exclamation marks from the ends of the words, but words are, and words are separated by a single space. There are no exclamation points uh, marks within a word. So you want to remove all the exclamation points from the end of the entire string. So, uh, no, excuse me, from the end of every word in the string. So if you look at this last example here, um, when I run my remove exclamations function on this string right here, I want to get back 
all the exclamation points before the word, but get rid of the ones after the word. So the second high right here, the three exclamation points are missing. So I need to write a write a uh, function that gets rid of any trailing ex exclamation points. So, um, so the function is going to run and it's going to give us a result and then it's going to do the comparison operation and print the result of that comparison, which if we haven't actually done anything, they all return the false because they're not changing anything. So this exclamation point is staying. So, um, and I'm not returning anything. I'm just passing. So I don't get anything back. I don't get this back from the function until I actually have it return the string. So even if I just return a string, this one should evaluate to true. And if I run this, there it is. It's true. Because I just fed the string in and this returned it. And then this comparison gave back to that true. But the rest are false because they're not the same. So um, so that's where the string is whatever, whenever you call the function, that's what this is. So getting back to that parameter again, defining a parameter, the first time I call this string is high with one exclamation point. The second time this is called string is high with three exclamation points at the end. So uh, does anybody have a solution for this that they want to share? You want us to post it into the chat or you want us to talk it through? Um, either one. I mean, if you post it in chat, it'll be faster. But if you want to, you can even talk through it after you post it if you want. Okay, so we have we have one. So let's go ahead and paste it in. And then I just actually need to copy that. I think I didn't copy. Okay. So here we have, and let's go ahead and run this, see if it evaluates all the true. So we are correct. This is, you know, each one is correct. So we know we have a good solution here. Uh, so we're saying, okay, so we're splitting the string. So that's one of the methods we learned uh, on Monday is to split a string. When we do that and split it on white space, you know, we put nothing in there, it's gonna split on white space. You need to make a list. And it looks like you even have some intermediate steps to actually print it out. So we can run that and kind of see uh, what each one did. So the first one, because it's just one word, was one was a one item list. Same with the other next three. And then when we got to example four and uh, or five and six, uh, we end up with a multi item list. Uh, so a, uh, a list with three strings or a list with two strings in it. And then you're making a new list, an empty list. So you're making a, you're defining a new list as empty list. And then, oh, you're, you're, you're going into looping. So, um, so for word and list string, uh, so you're going to evaluate each one. So you're going to evaluate this one first. And you're using the R strip, which I did not go over. So you did a little research, right? And, uh, you stripped off the the end at the end of the word, you stripped off the exclamation point, and then you appended that to the new list. And then your result was to join. So you did the reverse of splitting, you just joined it, uh, and um, that's how you got your result. So um, if we comment that out, let's go ahead and do that. And run. We can kind of see how the R strip method took off the trailing exclamation points, and that's what that's what that does. So we went a little beyond and did a little research on your own and uh, found uh, found a a, a built-in method that uh, 
takes off the uh, exclamation point at the end. So we can actually go uh, into here, Python. So Python R strip. You can go in W3 schools. So R strip removes any white spaces at the end of the string. And R strip means right strip. Um, so it's at the end of the string. That's how we, uh, that's how we, uh, but you can also give it a, a parameter to remove uh, something else. So in this case, um, you can remove a set of characters, remove as trailing uh, characters. Can you show how you would do it uh, without the for loop and R strip? Sure. Yeah. So let's see here. All right. How can we do this without using a loop? I mean, that's how I would do it. <laughs> so um, let's see here. Um, let's start with the, again, the easy one. So um, we can, uh, let's see. Without using... I, I started playing with the last two on lines 10 and 11 because uh -huh. it had multiple highs. And and that's why I, I just needed a I needed a for loop. And so that's why I did the for loop. So I'm just very interested to see how you're gonna do this without the for loop. Yeah, that's a that's a good one. That'll take me a minute to think about. I've never even I don't think I've ever done this without a for <laughs> for loop, to be honest with you. Um Let's see here. Um, let's see. Um, I know I can do. I can do if I can do an if statement, maybe. Um, So it looks like we have, well, we have all highs in there, so we can maybe identify those. And then, so we can identify the high, and then we know that we have the two. Have a good one, Thomas. Um, gosh, this one, okay, so if, so let's try and change to all uppercase first. So um, string upper equals string dot upper, right? So that will give me all uppercase. And why is my tabbing all weird? I guess it's auto tuning. It's auto tabbing the two spaces. That's fine. Um. So then I can find, so I can find the word high, because I know high is always in there. So, so location, location equals string upper, find i so now i know the index that i have at least the first the first one and then i want to remove all of the exclamation points after that so i can say Result, this will be for the ones without multiple occurrences. So result equals um, string. And I'm going to take a slice. And I want to do from the beginning 
to location plus two. I'm going to print results, see what happens. Print results. It's not, it's going to be, this is good for one word, I think. Hi. Hi. Okay. That's correct. So I knocked out four trues, but again, with the multiple words. Okay, so... So that that is a way to at least get some of it stripped. What did the plus two do? I'm so trying, I know what it does, but I'm trying to. So this is a slice of the string, and what I'm doing is, is I found I found the word high, right? Which is going to be you know sometimes it's so whatever index the 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 high starts at, I want to I want to include the word high. But take everything else out. So when I took the last, the last, uh, the the slice, I wanted to go up to, but not including the uh, character right after the letter H or letter oh, I. Got it. Because when you do the find, it just goes to the very first index of the word. Got gotcha. Right. And so high is always two letters. So I was like, okay, well, I can go up and then not include anything else after that, which is exactly what happens, right? So, and these the ones that are false. Um, I'm getting I'm getting the first high, but then after it's all cutting off everything else out. So, um, so maybe I can look for um, maybe I can look for spaces because the ones with single words don't have any spaces. So I can I can look for spaces and then use an if statement to do something different at that point, maybe. So, um, yeah, all right. I mean, this one really isn't, it's not that hard, um, but, you know, especially if you kind of use, use loops, uh, and you'll see by the end of Quick Pass, you'll be able to do a, a problem like this, no, no problem. Um, but yeah, um, but what I'm trying to do is really use a lot of the string methods that we used in lesson one. So um, this one can be challenging. This one, you know, it is challenging. I'm, I'm sitting here trying to scratch my head because I've always just <laughs> used a loop. But um, um. You know, following my logic here, though, when I when I first I, I want to cast an all to uppercase and and why would I want to do that? Like, why would I want to make an all uppercase? For simplicity, uh, to make sure all the letters are the same. Right, because I have a mix. I have a capital letter here. Like here I have a capital letter, but then I have a lowercase letter H here. So I, have, I mix them. And so. Um, what I'm doing is I'm I'm casting I'm casting everything to uppercase. That way I know I can do a comparison and always I know this is what I'm going to be finding when I do that. So that's why I cast it at the uppercase. And then here again, all I'm doing is finding the location of the word high. And then the result, what I'm doing here is I'm just I'm just getting a slice of that initial string and then getting rid of all the exclamation points after that. So, um, so maybe I can say, okay, well, if, so if, in, um, string, I want to do something else, then pass else. Like that, maybe. So result equals string. Okay. And so now if I have a space in string, without a loop, how can I tackle the spaces in there? 
And how do I clear this out? I forget how I have to, I think it's clear history. Oh, there it is. Okay, cool. How can I tackle the spaces without a loop? So if the space is in the string, so I find a space, then hmm. if you find a, I don't know, I don't have a clue. <laughs> I mean, I could count and count the highs. What other string methods do we have where we're not looping? Oh, yeah, the replace method. That's right. So we can use replace. But how do we selectively how do we selectively keep the exclamation points in front of the word but get rid of the trailing ones? That's a good one. That's a good, that's a, it's a real good problem to solve. We may have to table this one. Using a loop is super easy, right? Just loop over the string. Um, and whenever you have a word, then you can get rid of everything else after that until you run to another letter or another exclamation, or I guess until you get a space. Hmm. That's a that one's an interesting problem to solve. I think it's safe to move this problem to day three, something like that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, this one, we can revisit this one. I'm I'm going to come up with something. I know I can do it. <laughs> uh, so, Leon, the location plus two is a string slice. So, uh, remember, what is, what is, when I define location here, what is that? So, this is location. There you go. So now you should see what it is, right? So I run that. Um, and let me just go ahead and get rid of this for now. So <laughs> let's just do that. Uh, I still have a problem, don't I? Inundation. Uh, unexpected indent. So I have to go like that. There we go. Now run it. There we go. So if you look at... Uh, um. So if you look at location uh, right here, location is equal to string upper. So I'm again, I'm I'm using my redefined uppercase string, and I'm finding the word high all in uppercase. And then the first two locations and the first two uh, examples, high is right there, index zero. But then on the second or the third and fourth one, it's actually at location index one. Because there's a, a leading exclamation point. Um, and so that one is actually being used. So when I'm using it here, 
I'm actually I'm the the result is equal to this string, and then um, in this case it is uh, it starts at the beginning and location is either zero or one, so one for example, and then it's plus two, so it's actually three. So in the example right here where location, so when you have a, a leading exclamation point, the the actual um, string is location uh, blank colon one plus two or blank colon three. That's what it is. So what I'm doing is I'm using a variable and then and then using a little bit of math to move the end location of my my string slice because this is this is what's called slicing a string. I'm taking a substring of the whole string to get a result. I'm taking off the exclamation points. Awesome. Oh, so one one has a, a one has a solution. So yeah, we can we can slice at the empty string, like redefine it, if you will, maybe hold hold like the initial. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, but how would you do that in a repeated process? But I like how you're thinking. So you're saying slice. So slice it at the empty string. And then restart the process or. But how would you know how many string variables to make at this? Like, what if this was like seven different. So James, you're asking, can I explain the functions of each symbol in line seven? Sure. Um, so yeah, one, I'm gonna chew on that for a little bit, like how we can do that, like in a repeated process but without a loop, that's the tough part. Like, cause if you wanna, if you wanna split, once you, once you uh, slice a portion off, like how do you slice another portion off without using like a loop or something? So, um, but to to go back to James, James asked uh, about the function of each symbol. So if you remember string slicing, and I'm going to go back to my Jupyter notebook here, um, my string uh, equals, um, I like chocolate. Okay. And then, and let me move this over a little bit so you can see it a little easier. Um, if I want to get the word chocolate from my string, right? If I want to take a slice of that string, that's where those symbols are. So when when you were talking about, um, uh, you know, my string, and then I did, if I want to start at the beginning, right? And then go to index, so you're one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it's an eight. Yeah, I think it's eight. So I like C, so I can do, so I can do actually six, a two including six. There we go. So the symbols are the open bracket signifies that I'm going to be doing either an index or a slice or something, right? And then um, if I want to go get the word like, I want to start it at index zero, one, two, and I want to go to six, up to but not including six, that should be the word like. And then if I want to go, uh, so that's up to, but not including six, that's six, that's seven. If I wanted the word chocolate, I could do um, seven colon to the end, and there's chocolate. So all I'm doing is taking a slice of the string. So I'm taking that part with the seven colon and then going all the way, leaving it empty just all the way to the end. So index seven to the end is chocolate. Um, 
If I want to start at the beginning, I leave that blank and go to whatever index. If I do negative one, I'm going to go up to, but not including the E. So it's going to be chocolat. So I take off the E. Um, but if I if I just, you know, if I do that, then we get everything. But um, uh, that's how you do string slicing. Is that uh, is that what you're asking uh, with the symbols on line seven? Yes, the colon means a slice. And if you have two colons, that means you want to start, a stop, and a step. So um, the two optional ones are start and step. The, the stop will always be there. If I'm not mistaken, I think that's right. <laughs> All right, um, but one, I'm going to chew on that because I like how we can maybe take slice the empty string um, and find location. Maybe I can think of a think of a solution on that without using a loop. That'd be the tough part. I mean, I know I can use like regex or something. Um, regular expressions are very very powerful at looping, um, but those are beyond the scope of this course as well. I want to try and find a solution that's in scope of this course, which that could be proved to be tough, but we'll see. But anyway, that's the end of the class. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Um...